Hi, I'm Raj Kletke, and I need to apologize this year not only for being late on my usual winter series, but also for not really having any new content. Unfortunately, I didn't get in enough fishing this year, but now I have a new hip, a new camera, plans to be on the stream more this year, and I'm excited about some ideas for the 2023 winter ser series, so be sure to check back next winter also. <clears throat> I thought about skipping this year entirely, but decided to rehash some material from my Fly Fishing Hatches series with slightly different organization and emphasis. So this is from a talk that I gave to our local TU chapter this year. I'm hoping that the different organization from the previous series may be of value, and if you're new to the sport and you haven't seen the previous series, perhaps this will spark some interest in looking for and fly fishing hatches. <clears throat> When I first started fly fishing, I read about these glorious hatches and wondered why I never saw them. I felt hatches must be extremely rare and only on some mystical streams that I'll probably never get to fish. Ultimately, I realized the magazines were describing super hatches and that hatches are really very common, essentially daily on trout streams. Yes, there are times on streams when attractors are likely, likely your best choice of flies and often they will continue to work during hatches. But I believe that even during some sparse hatches, you will catch more and larger trout fishing with specific flies for that hatch. So let's learn how to recognize and fish these common but often sparse hatches. <clears throat> to help recognize a hatch, it's important to know what hatches to expect when you're on the water. So let's quickly look at a typical hatch chart. It's obvious that multiple hatches are possibly going to happen daily during the fishing season. <clears throat> However, not all these hatch bars imply the same thing. For example, trichos are listed as occurring July through September, and they are quite consistent of fishable daily hatch in proper weather, usually on nice days, on streams in which they exist. You can plan trips around trico hatches. Blue wing olives, including tiny blue wing olives, may occur almost daily as shown, especially on damp overcast days, but are far less consistent than trichos. But you should always be thinking about a possible blue wing olive hatch when on the stream. Midges are hatching daily, but are often quite sparse. Some others have quite short hatch periods, only a week or two, but this may occur during the time frame listed, but does not occur throughout the time frame listed, like trichos. Of course, we should define a hatch before we go on much further. The term hatch clearly isn't the organism leaving the egg as defined in the dictionary, but it's used variably by fly fishermen. My current definition has evolved over many years as my expectations of hatches has changed. Now I simply use a specific organism or even stage of an organism in significant numbers being available to trout. I deliberately leave significant numbers vaguely defined because occasionally it may be a very few organisms that trout will key in on. And I don't require that a hatch elicits trout feeding, although usually it does. When possible, I try to be more specific by subtyping common hatches as pre-emergent, in other words, when the nymphs or larvae are active shortly prior to emergence, emergent or post-emergent egg laying and spinner falls. We're talking today about mayfly hatches, and mayflies die very quickly, so their egg laying stage is actually very brief. But some, not all, provide us with the opportunity to fish a spinner fall. I like the term abundance hatch for non-emerging organisms, but I still do use hatch in a very general form. <clears throat> My anecdotal experiences with hatches are mainly from the Bitterroot River and other western rivers and the driftless area streams of Iowa. Books describe differences in hatches on Freestone and Spring Creeks, but each stream is best treated as unique. The Bitterroot is a Freestone River, but it is in a wide valley and quite stable after the early season snowmelt with its runoff until it sometimes warms up a little bit in late summer. It has very consistent and often very heavy hatches. The Iowa Driftless Area streams and rivers are mainly spring-fed, but they're in coolies, <clears throat> deep valleys, so get rain runoff that scour the streams and destroy many of the aquatic organisms. They tend to have sparser, but still some excellent hatches, but not like the famous western spring creeks. But whether freestone or spring-fed, the way I fish hatches on these streams and rivers seems more dependent on the number of organisms and the numbers of fishermen. 
No, the bitter root is not this bad, but its hatches do get fished every day by numerous fishermen. The fish are so used to fishermen that they seem to know you're there but ignore you. Unfortunately, they commonly ignore your flies also, and some even feel the trout may become sensitized to common fly patterns. You can get incredibly close to the fish, and even if you do put them down, they'll usually quickly return during a heavy hatch. Even though there's lots of rising fish, the fishing can be very challenging, even frustrating. In Iowa, there are less fishermen and fishing the hatches can be easier or sometimes very, very challenging, but in different ways than on the bitter root. Today, we're only talking about mayfly hatches, so let's look at mayflies. Mayflies are subclassified by their nymph stage, which we'll be mentioning only briefly today. Swimmer nymphs may also be reasonable searching nymphs. Nymphs will go through many instars before they mature. Ultimately, the late stage nymph, most of, most of which will have darkened wing cases shortly prior to emergence, will emerge as a dun, which then molts once more to a spinner. This last molt may occur almost immediately after emergence, as with trichos, or later, as with most other mayflies. The spinner is the sexually mature stage, which means it's the egg-laying stage and the stage that, for some mayflies, as we said earlier, will become the spent spinners we like to fish. For most of the mayflies, all these stages from nymph to spinner are fishable, but there are some exceptions. While it shouldn't be true, we often don't start thinking about hatches until we see emerging or flying insects, so recognizing an adult mayfly may become important. The adult duns are the upright winged insects, the little sailboats that when on the water are easy to recognize as mayflies. In flight, especially when few in numbers, the adult duns and spinners are harder to recognize. You may make a guess because commonly you know what hatches to expect from the hatch charts, and usually mayflies are larger than midges and have a smoother, more graceful flight than caddis or stoneflies. For any type of hatch, there are three main considerations. You must recognize the hatch, choose proper flies, and choose proper techniques for the location and water type. Recognizing the hatch is often the most difficult, but we're going to start with a trico spinner fall because recognizing this hatch is usually very simple. Commonly out west, they are super hatches, but even in Iowa, the trichos are reasonably numerous much of the time. The smaller trico males emerge generally at night and females in the mo morning. Some females emerge on the water surface, so can be a fun emergence hatch also. Mating clusters form shortly after the females emerge and are easy to see at treetop height, sparkling in the sun. Even with relatively sparse hatches, these clusters are easy to see if you're looking for them. These clusters now include the males that hatched the night before, the females that you saw emerging from the surface, and females that emerge on streamside vegetation. These mating clusters are often much denser than you expected if you just saw the females emerging in the morning. Sometimes the spinner fall, in fact, usually the spinner fall will start within about an hour or thereafter as you watch these clusters become closer and closer to the water. Commonly, you'll see a few rising fish first and see the spinners on the surface of the water. Rarely, you'll see the spent spinners on the water first. Out west, the trico spinner fall is often a super hatch with the spent spinners even forming mats and the fish taking only a small percentage of the naturals. In Iowa, the spinner fall is usually less dense and the fish are taking a higher percentage of the spinners, so sometimes fishing in Iowa may be easier. Trichos are very small and size is likely the most important factor. When choosing a fly for a hatch, you should consider what stage is the most numerous, the most vulnerable, and the most concentrated and where it's concentrated. Again, with trico spinner falls, choosing the fly is obvious. The spinner is the most numerous, the most vulnerable, and the most concentrated in the surface or just below. Spinner size may not be uniform. During one spinner fall, I found trichos that ranged from a hook size 18 to 26, but generally pick the dominant size. Size 22 is the main size that I tie and fish. So, choose your favorite spinner pattern in a size 20 to 24. Match the dominant spinner size. Mainly, I use this poly spinner. You may have noticed that I tie my pattern in reverse without tails. The wings are shorter than you might expect, and it has a very thick thorax. 
This is a standard pattern known as ALS pattern. The trico spinners that fly shop sells, <coughs> sell are fine and have tails. I don't know how many fishermen would buy a tailless spinner, but sometimes these tails are stiff and I think prevent hookups. So if you're having trouble hooking up, try cutting the tails off and you may see that you get better hookups on these tiny flies. <coughs> I have added a strand of crystal flash to my wing uh, lately, which sometimes helps me see the fly on sunny days, and I hope will draw attention to my fly when there's abundant naturals passing by. But so far, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily better than my slightly easier to tie ALS poly spinner. You'll also note that I have a wide thorax. And I think the wide thorax is important because both the male trico spinner and the slightly larger female trico spinner have fat thoraces. Incidentally, you'll notice that the males and females have slightly different sizes and coloration. The males fall first from the mating clusters, and some feel that you should start fishing a trico spinner fall with a male pattern. I've not found that the color difference or even the slight difference in size seems to be a significant factor. <clears throat> Why do I think the fat thorax is important? I like Hewitt's factors, which of what makes a good fly, and he ranks light effects number one. So let's look at the light effects of trico spinners. These are the spinners as you see them. Note the body with, it, with its thick thorax is indenting the surface the most. The wings are translucent or almost transparent and barely visible, and only rarely do you see any tails. After observing literally hundreds of trico spinners on the wall, I water, I feel the body is the dominant feature. And these are the light effects on the surface that a trout sees looking up on the usual sunny day. Note all the small linear bright spots. These are the trichos. I believe these are the bodies we're seeing indenting the surface. You really don't see appreciable wings or tails. I've tried long wings, short wings, wide wings. I believe that the wings are important now mainly to keep the fly on the surface. And sometimes you don't even want that because sometimes a sunken spinner does seem to work best. So anyway, here again is that simple Alds poly spinner. I tie mainly that. I do try some other patterns, but I'm not convinced that changing patterns really helps, not even on the bitter root, where I think fish do become sensitive to certain patterns. Just get a decent trico spinner pattern, be sure it's the correct size, and keep fishing with it. Because ultimately, fishing a trico spinner fall is a numbers game, especially during a super hatch. It'll often take numerous casts, sometimes 30 or more, to a single fish to get a strike. So be as efficient as possible with your casting, but don't get sloppy. Try to get as near to the fish as you can without spooking them. You can get quite close during a super hatch out west, but not as close in Iowa during the more moderate hatches that I usually see there. But this will allow you to use as short a line cast as you possibly can, which gives you better drag control and you can cast again quicker. Try not to make many false casts other than to dry off your fly or line as that just wastes time. Keep your fly on the water. We'll spend a little time on techniques as these same techniques are used for many other hatches. Trichos are small and fish won't move far for them so casting needs to be accurate and I'm not a good enough caster to consistently hit a small target. Commonly, I can't even see my spinner. So while I prefer to fish a single fly to get the best dead drift, here I do drop the spinner off 18, 24 inches off an indicator fly, usually a 16 or 18 L caracatus. One day on the bitter root during a moderately heavy spinner fall, my three largest trout were on the L caracatus. So much for selective feeding. I usually use a 5X tippet to my indicator fly and a 6X tippet to the dropper. 7x might be better, but I've broken off too many good fish, so I really don't use 7x very much. There may be some trico spinners on riffles, in fact, usually are, and the fish may be easier to catch. Your spinner will likely sink, but you can watch your indicator fly and catch quite a few fish this way, especially in Iowa during sparse to moderate spinner falls. So occasionally I'll fish a trico spinner fall in the riffle, but remember that a trout must get more energy from the food it takes in than it expends in obtaining that food. So the larger trout will normally be in quieter water. So much of the time I'll fish a trico spinner fall on relatively calm, quiet water. 
My favorite quiet water has been on the edge of a stream or large river. So while the current is very slow where I'm fishing, the stream or river current still brings the spinners to the trout. So look for small, slow pockets of water near the shore with rising fish. Sometimes these can be quite shallow. On western rivers, I've not really done any good fishing mid-current, even though there are rising fish. So I tend to search out the slower edge water pieces before I start fishing. Even in Iowa, I try to look for slow water with rising fish. So on riffles with sparse organisms and not well-established feeding lanes, I may try fishing quartering upstream, but on quiet water, numerous organisms, and especially if there's well-established feeding lanes for the trout, I do much better fishing downstream. Basically, I try to fish any hatch on quiet water that requires ac accurate casting by fishing downstream because I have more control over the placement of my fly and I don't line the fish. I try to avoid fishing directly downstream as my strikes are then directly upstream, pulling the fly out of the fish's mouth, <clears throat> although occasionally this is necessary. So it's better to fish quartering downstream. I commonly use a reach cast, which is nothing more than starting your forward cast in the usual fashion and then reaching while releasing extra line from your non-casting hand as you reach your rod to the right or left, depending on the direction of the current. It's important to release line from your non-casting hand to prevent pulling back your fly line from the intended target. I'm using the end of my fly line here so you can see it in this video, but ideally you should use a fly. Make sure you can hit your target and then do your reach cast, releasing line so that it'll still hit the target rather than pull, being pulled back from it. A little lawn practice is very useful. Here's my poor drawing again, but I'm trying to show that I'm casting to a target, the X, which is past the feeding lane and upstream of the fish using my standard reach casts. I then pull the fly into the estimated feeding lane and release pressure to let the fly drift to or, if necessary, past the fish. My target will be about three to four feet upstream of the trout. This is actually a quite common way of fishing out west on the bitter route, so I've used this technique numerous times, and pattern is not as important as timing and placement in that situation. Most of us are used to fishing dry flies upstream, but fishing downstream to rising fish has significant differences. If the fish takes the fly, try to set the hook to the side. In other words, try setting towards the opposite bank rather than moving your rod straight up. This way here you have a better chance of trying to pull the fly into the side of the trout's mouth rather than pulling it out of the trout mouth, trout's mouth. If the fish doesn't take the fly, don't immediately start your back cast. Let the fly drift past the fish you're targeting and any other feeding fish that are in line and then slowly swing the fly away from the fish before recasting. You may want to cast one false cast to cast the water off your line away from the fish before your next try. The common advice is to target a single fish, and I'll try this if a fish appears especially large and has a well-established feeding lane, but commonly I'm not that successful. Generally, I do better if I cast to multiple fish sharing a small area. Perhaps they're competing for food and don't check out my fly as well. Try both approaches and see what works best for you. Well, that's long enough for now, but in part two, I'll talk about how I fish blue wing olive hatches and a few special considerations when fishing a few other mayflies. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.